My brother told me that he did stop using GPS in his car because he was once traveling to the Montefiore Cemetery and when he uh, arrived there, the GPS announced, you have arrived to your final destination. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there is one of these good and old Jewish anecdotes. And you know the oldies are always the best. Basically, from my experience, there's only 200 Jewish jokes, by the way. There's no more. There's 200 Jewish jokes. Uh, 50 of them are about rabbis. 50 of them are about uh, lawyers. Uh, 25 of them are about food. And uh, the rest are about marriage, mothers-in-law, uh, etc. So uh, this is one of those, you know, old ones but good ones. The rabbi and the priest and the minister who are sitting in Starbucks and sipping a latte and schmoozing. And what can a rabbi, a priest, and a minister talk about that is not controversial? What they would like to hear people say at their funeral. The priest says, you know, I would love if someone got up at my funeral and said he was a true servant of the Lord dedicated 24-7 to bringing the love and the light of the Lord to his constituents. The minister says, I would like to hear somebody speak at my funeral about my unique empathy. He was a real friend to the congregation. You could rely on him. You could trust him. He was there for you in the good times and the challenging times. Rabbi, how about you? What would you like to hear somebody say at your funeral. The rabbi says, I would like if somebody would say at my funeral, you know, I think he's moving. I just got it. <laughs> Like every anecdote, it captures something very Jewish. And that is we are a nation that loves life. A nation that's obsessed with life. A nation that believes in life. A nation that holds life to be sacred. Moses tells the Jewish people at the end of his life, there are two paths in life. There's the path to life and the path of death. In Deuteronomy, Ubacharta Bachayim. You should choose life. Two words. Those words have become immortalized and enshrined in the Jewish psyche. Over thousands of years, the Jewish people have lived up to this instruction of Moses. Choose life. Always choose life. Jews were liberated from Auschwitz-Birkenau in January 1945. They walked out of those accursed gates with the sign Arbet Macht Frei. And thousands of them heard those two words in the deepest parts of their soul. Choose life. And that's why we're here today. It's the only reason we're here today. It's so profoundly ingrained in the Jewish psyche that in the five books of Moses and in the Tanakh, you will not find clear, explicit, clear, explicit conversation about the afterlife. Because one of the reasons, the Chayva Salavavas gives ten reasons, but one of the reasons, I think, is because when the Torah was given, there was such an obsession with the afterlife, with death, with violence, with bloodshed, as there still is in many cults and religions, where you are promised a glorious afterlife, and if you die as a shaheed and a martyr, you come to heaven and are greeted by 72 pies of pizza. <laughs> or 72 rolls of sushi, or whatever the most recent version we're not going to go there at the moment. 
it was such an obsession in ancient times and still by some that the, the contrast is glaring. Choose life. But there's also another side to it. Many Jews don't even know what Judaism says about the afterlife. Many Jews don't even know that Judaism believes in an afterlife. Often in my journeys, people have asked me, is it true that Judaism believes in an afterlife? Is there such a thing in Judaism? They never hear about it. They heard sermons from rabbis for many years. Many of them put them to sleep. Other ones spoke about social justice, what we call tikkun olam, which is awesome. But after you die, eh, Christian ideas, Buddhist ideas, Hindu ideas. What does Judaism have with after you die? So that's the other side of it, and that's a problem. Because it's a very real part of Judaism, and there's an enormous literature within Judaism. And the Talmud, and the Midrash, and the Zohar, in many, many sources in Jewish philosophy, Jewish ethics, Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, Hashkafa, Machshava, various branches of Jewish literature, Hasidic spirituality about the afterlife. So I'm going to try today to touch on a few of those seminal points briefly. And just obviously the topic is, is profound and long and not easily uh, digestible and exhaustible, but at least we can begin the journey with some basic insights and ideas into the Jewish perspective on afterlife. The first thing that we always have to understand when exploring this topic is, what do we mean when we say the words afterlife? People ask a question, is there life after death? That question in Judaism is a non-starter, and the reason is because, of course, there's no life after death. That which is dead is dead, and that which live, which is alive, lives. If it's life, it lives. If it's death, it's dead. There's no life after death. The question is, what is alive and what is dead? If something is alive, it's alive. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Because <laughs> I don't. But it sounds good, no? Okay, that's the main thing. <laughs> so what is this guy talking about? So let me try to make sense of what my subconscious just said. Um, you got to wake up over there in the back. You got to wake up. Go take a coffee and wake up. Um, so if you listen carefully, everyone has something to say. Everything says something, right? So the other day, I had an imaginary conversation with my refrigerator. I spend time at the refrigerator. I, I open it, I close it. Uh, when I'm stressed, I open the refrigerator. I opened it five minutes ago, but somehow I hope that the prophet Elijah put in some new items in the refrigerator. <laughs> Did you ever realize how many times people open the refrigerator? I just opened it. No, no, no. But there's some, probably something I didn't find, <laughs> right? Like uh, cheesecake from Shavuos, whatever. Something must be in the refrigerator. How much people open the refrigerator? It's like, it's a shtickle, it's a shtickle addiction. It's called refrigerator addiction. Some people call it food addiction, but it sounds better if it's a refrigerator addiction. So in any case, I'm having this conversation with my refrigerator. And the refrigerator is like, you know, I am sick and tired of being under a dictator. I really want to be autonomous. I really need self-actualization. I really need to be independent. I cannot stand being and living under the tyranny of monarchs and dictators who control everything about me. And I look at the refrigerator and I'm like, yeah, I agree, free at last, free at last. How are we gonna do this? And the refrigerator says, you know, this whole thing with this, uh, I'm always plugged into this wall and I'm always connected near the wall. I have to be near the wall and dependent on this electricity. I just wanna be free. I want to be free to roam wherever I want, to be whatever I want, to do whatever I want. Do me a favor, unplug me. Unplug me. And, very good. So I unplugged the refrigerator, and you know what happened? 
Jesus got dal. For Jesus got dash. The cheesecake died. The fruits and vegetables died. The refrigerator dead. It was dead. It was a big, lifeless, useless body that had occupied extra space in my home for no reason. Mm. So, how do we understand that electricity? When the refrigerator is unplugged, did the electricity die? <laughs> what do you think? No, electricity doesn't die. Where did the electricity go? Where did it go to? Huh? It went... Okay, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I know that it went to the place where electricity belongs. Which, which, electricity, so what happened? Where's the electricity? It was here. My refrigerator was working. My refrigerator was working. To bring it to this room, mamas to this room, your iPhone. I had a conversation with my iPhone. You know, we have had an old, a good relationship, pretty good relationship. I mean, the boundaries are blurred. And uh, we're trying to separate for a little bit and see if we could go on with our lives independently so we can come back from a healthier place together because I have my needs, the telephone has its needs. The needs of the telephones are complete and absolute control 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even when I'm taking a bath. I have needs for my own space. So we're trying to work out the separation. So I unplugged it. Dead. Mamish, dead. A few hours, it still lingered. And then it was gone, finished, dead. No return, nothing, no texts, mamish, not even WhatsApp. It was all dead. Unplugged. The plug somehow was channeling something. Vacuum cleaner, refrigerator, computer, iPhone. Used to be the tape recorders, Alaya Mashalam, the air conditioner. <laughs> what happened? For thousands of years, we didn't even know about electricity. Mamash didn't know about electricity. Imagine. And then one day, not very long ago, in the 19th century, human civilization, humanity discovered this extraordinary force that exists in our planet called electricity. And what happened? We just opened ourselves up to the availability of electricity. We created then the vessels, the kalim, the channels to channel electricity. So when electricity, when the refrigerator is plugged into the wall, electricity flows through it, and the refrigerator can do what it has to do. The same is true with your laptop, the same is true with your phone, the same is true with your vacuum cleaner, the same is true with your air conditioner, the same is true with your radio or alarm clock or whatever else you're using electricity for. What happens when you unplug it? The electricity doesn't die, the electricity just goes back to where it always belongs because the channel, channeling the electricity to allow it to flow through the refrigerator to cool the food has been interrupted. You get the point? Life doesn't die. Is there life after death? Of course not. But that which is alive never dies. The human body is like the refrigerator. Extraordinary refrigerator far more complex, 50 trillion cells, 100 billion neurons. And it's a channel for the electricity, which we call the soul. And that electricity is manifested through the body. What is the body without the electricity? It's a corpse that decomposes ultimately. So it's the electricity that gives vitality, it vivifies, it's the current that gives vitality, personality to the body, which we call the neshama, the soul. What happens by death? What happens by death is it's unplugged. We're unplugged. So the soul literally becomes part of what it always was and where it always was, barring the years that the soul was manifested, the electricity was manifested through the physical body which is why the real world word for death in Jewish mysticism is not death. The Talmud says in Tractate Tainus, page 5, B, Yaakov Avinu Lai, Mace, Jacob our father didn't die. How can the Talmud speak these words? The answer is when you're sensitive to the electricity of life, you realize death is not really described by death. A more accurate definition of death is unplugged unplugged. The same soul, that same reality continues to live. 
in a way, even with more intensity, because it's not being channeled through a limited vessel. That's what the Tanya says, with more intensity. So Yaakov, our father, who was always in tune with electricity, didn't die. Nobody dies. What happens is the connection is not manifested. The electricity is not flowing through your laptop. It's not flowing through the body. So I'm talking to the body, and it's dead. One of the most transformative moments in my life was when I walked into the hospital room where my father lay ill. Just moments after, and a moments later, he returned. I, I was there in the morning, and then I left, and I came back, and when I came to the door, I saw that something was wrong, and when I came in, I saw that he's just passed away. I was with him in the morning. We were communicating. He was fully alive. Some of you sitting in this audience knew my father. He was a very, very vivacious, creative, engaging, interesting personality. He was a little different. He was quite original. And he had a lot inside of him. He was a very interesting conversationalist and a fascinating dad and human being and journalist. He was just a, one hell of a guy, as they say. And even when he was ill, the personality was still there. And I'm looking at him, and nothing is there. It's just a corpse. And the machines are all quiet. You know how the machines go dead. It's just a, everything is silent. There's an eerie serenity because there's nobody to help anymore. There's nobody to heal. And just my mind asked one question. Where did my father's personality go? Where did 70 years, he was 70, where did 70 years of his life go? Where did it go? What happened to it? Did it just mamish all fade away into oblivion? And all that's left for my father is fodder for the worms in a cemetery in Queens? Mamish, is that really it? I wasn't asking then a scientific question and a question that's going to the laboratory. It was just in my kishkas. I was looking at my father and I was trying to, where is it all? Because it's not here anymore. There's nothing here. And then I knew at the moment it was all there. It was just not being manifested through that vehicle we call the body. Which of course for us who stay behind is very, very painful. And it's a pain that we don't overcome. Which is why you should never confuse belief in the afterlife with elimination of pain. Because I can't relate to electricity. You know what happens if I put my hand into the core of electricity? You know what happens? Right. And it's not a place you want to be in. Refrigerators, I like. Phones, I can deal with. You know why? Because the electricity is being channeled through the food. That I'm good. Good fresh tomato. I'm fine. It's impacted by the electricity. But electricity in its core, nobody ever saw electricity. Nobody can define what it is. <laughs> There's not a person in the world who can say what it is, but nobody doubts that it exists. I never heard somebody say, I'm an atheist. Electricity does not exist. You never saw it. That's true. You never saw it. Nobody saw it. Nobody can describe what it is. Nobody knows what it is. But we see it manifested constantly. Which is why it's not too hot in the room, even though for me it is hot. Because <laughs> the electricity. I can't see it. And if I'm there, I'm not here. And that's why the pain of death is a very real pain, because the contact through the physical manifestation is gone. Somebody once told me something very meaningful, and uh, I found it helpful for me, and I found it very helpful sharing it with others. When I was sitting shiva for my late father, whom I just mentioned, somebody came in to visit, and he said something very profound, simple and profound. And he said, when a loved one dies, a parent dies, or another loved one dies, a ditch opens up in your heart. A ditch opens up in your life. Literally a ditch, a cistern, a cave, a hole in the ground, a hole in your ground. And you know what happens, he says? In the beginning, you keep on falling into that pit. He says, imagine... In your dining room, suddenly, there's a huge hole that opens up in the dining room. Literally a pit. And 
Each time you walk from the kitchen to your living room through the dining room, you know what happens? You fall right in and you got to climb out and it's not easy to climb out. He says, that's exactly what it looks like. A hole just opened up in your life and every time you try to walk through your home, you're going to be falling right into it. You're going to wake up in the morning, you're going to fall into the ditch. You're going to sit down to eat lunch. Well, the Shabbos is coming, you're going to fall in. Every milestone, every moment, many times, every time you walk through the house, you're in that place. And then he said, with time, the ditch does not go away. The pit never goes away. With time, you just learn to walk around it. That's all. You look at it, you see it, you know it, maybe you even wink at it. You just learn to walk around. But not always. Sometimes you forget and you walk right back into it. Maybe before a holiday, maybe as you're marrying off a child, maybe as you're experiencing something in life, maybe just on a Thursday morning or Thursday evening. Unconsciously, you walk right back into it. But it will always be there. When I was a child, they always would chase us out of shul for yisker. You're familiar with the yisker services we do on the holidays. And they never allowed people with parents to stay in the synagogue. You know that? It's a very interesting custom. Now, I loved it because it was a free permission to leave the synagogue. And once you were out, you never came back. So it was good. <laughs> once you were, out, you were So I didn't mind. I didn't mind. But when I got older already, so I had an interesting experience once. I grew up in the Cronheights section of Brooklyn. And Yom Kippur, the Lubavitcher Rebbe would say what's called Mafter Yonah, the Mafter about Jonah being swallowed in the fish. And it was a very emotional experience to hear him say it. And then at the end of Yom Kippur, he would jump up on a chair and dance some song that Napoleon soldiers used to sing. It's called Napoleon's March. Die, da, die, da, die. And he would get up on a chair at the end of Yom Kippur. It was a very powerful a spiritual experience. And I had a good place, and I didn't want to lose it. But by Yisker, I had to go out because both of my parents are alive. And once you went out, there were 10,000 people rushing back in. You lost your place. So I decided I'm going to hide in the shul behind a beam so people won't see me. And that way I'll be there. And the shul was empty because anybody who had parents, which means a lot of young people were gone. And then by the time the doors open and everybody crosses back in, I'll be the first because I'm already in the synagogue. The Lubavitcher Rebbe <laughs> was on the bima, and they were starting Yisker. And I remember there was an eerie silence in the shul. It was mostly empty. People didn't have parents. But most of the people were young and they had parents, thank God. And uh, the Rebbe looked around. <laughs> and his eyes <laughs> hit the point where I was behind the beam. And he looked at me with such intensity. In a very, hmm, how do I say it? Clear and intense way. You really don't belong here. So I ran out of shul. I just ran, I ran out of shul. It was fascinating because I was behind the beam. If he was standing, I was like behind the beam, and I was like hiding. I was, I was like near, near if those who know the structure there was near the entrance to what used to be the back bathrooms. And I was saying, he gave a look. I ran out. When I grew up, I remember my father died. I was already uh, 31 or 32, and I was an adult. I was married, thank God. And the first time I was by Yisker was Shavuos. Shavuos 2005, I was by Yisker. And I remembered wondering, why did they always chase out the kids? And again, they chased out anybody who didn't have parents. And I remained alone in the room. And then I understood immediately that everybody in that room shared something in common with each other. Everybody had a piece of them that was swallowed up by the earth. Everyone had a little piece of them that died. Because when a loved one dies, a piece of the person also goes. Everyone in that room had that. And somebody who has, thank God, their loved ones present could not be in that room. It wasn't fear for them and wasn't fear for everybody else. There was also a certain presence of the souls in the room. And if you weren't connected on that level, you really didn't belong there. And that's why there is a paradox in Judaism. On one hand, we talk about the fact that there is a very real pain. We don't look at death and say, eh, it's nothing, the soul is in a good place. 
I cannot tell you about the stupid things I have heard people say at Shiva. I can write a book of the brilliant, idiotic comments like, you must be relieved that he's gone. <laughs> yes, absolutely, I was looking forward for this day my whole life. At least he's in a good place. Well, why don't you go to those places? <laughs> yeah? Or I was not, not long ago at a shiva, at a shiva call, and some guy was just nudging the living daylights out of the guy sitting shiva. And he says, I have to say this in Yiddish, there's this posak, there's this stanza, this verse that we say, hamakom, yenachem, askem, right? I have to say it in Yiddish. He says, Zog the Pasuk und trag sich up. Uh, people, whatever, they don't have seichel, you know? When you don't got seichel, or you feel awkward, you sit down and say stupid things. The pain is very real because the contact is not there. On the other hand, when we understand what life is, a soul doesn't die. A soul doesn't live after its death. It never died. Unplugged. That's the word, unplugged. The soul was there before birth, soul was there after death. Because electricity was not created when you plugged in the refrigerator. Electricity is here since God created the cosmos. Plugging in the refrigerator only means that you channeled the electricity through your refrigerator or computer or vacuum cleaner or iPhone or AC. That's principle number one we have to understand. Principle number two, and now I get to the exciting reality of paradise versus hell. What does it look like? Anybody knows? <laughs> there was a girl dating a Jewish boy. She came from a very religious family. She came home from the 10th date, and she said, Ma, I like him, but I cannot marry him. Mom said, why not? He doesn't believe in hell. He doesn't believe in this. <laughs> oh, the mother says, you don't worry about that. Between you and me, we will show him it exists. It's fine. <laughs> so... You like that, eh? but you're laughing too loud. You are going to get a punishment for that. I just know. <laughs> so, what is, what is this? What is, what is this all about? And I'm talking about conversations I have with refrigerators. You'll forgive me. The women will forgive me. I have to deal with fungus in my feet a lot. And the doctor told my foot doctor told me you can't sweat. Your fungi loves moisture. It loves when you sweat. It brings friends over. They have a poolside party, like octopuses. They're all over the matzav in your foot. I said, what am I supposed to do? She says, when you sweat, only first of all, only cotton socks, cotton, a hundred percent, not ninety percent cotton and etc. A hundred percent, and you change it in the middle of the day. Sweat, you change. I don't care if you change it many times a day. So the first mitzvah of the doctor I observed. The second one is too challenging. I have made a peace treaty with the fungi. <laughs> but one day, but one day again, forgive my illustration. The socks were not doing so well. They were transferring a particular type of aroma and they were dirty and they were filthy and they were sweaty. So I took these wonderful cotton socks and I put them in a washing machine. I filled them up with water. The water was hot. I put in some chemicals and then started the hakafos. And the sock started to twirl as I mummish for 45 minutes with hot water. God opened the mouth of the socks. And the socks turned to me and said, Rabbi, why, why? Why are you so cruel to me? Why are you so sadistic? I 
I am the socks that you have spent so much time in. All your lectures, all your presentations, all your classes. Who holds you up? Who comforts you? Who gives you solace on the bottom? Who's there? Who's really, who's the foundation? Who do you step on and never makes a pip? Who peep? Who's mama's there for you from morning till midnight? Walks with you wherever you go, wherever you drive. It's always your support and always gives you that tender love and care. That sense, of, it's me. Why would you plunge me into such hot water and with chemicals, cursed chemicals, and have we twirl around? Where is this torture coming from? I thought you were a nice man. And I turned to my socks and I said, my dear beloved socks, our relationship is as intact and powerful as it ever was. I could never tell you how appreciative I am, but let me explain to you. When I bought you, you were so pure. You were so clean. You were so smooth. And your odor was also very, very fine. But as a result of our interactions and walking around in the August season of New York, not Washington, but New York, where I come from, your smell has been compromised a little bit and your cleanliness has been compromised. And I want to bring you back to your pristine state of purity, beauty, and fragrance. So I'm putting you into this washing machine to be able to get back what I always had. The socks were happy. I was happy. And since then we have enjoyed a very meaningful and powerful relationship. When people hear the word hell, punishment, fires, purgatory, we have to understand two things. Point number one, the idea that God is out to get people, that God is going to get you, that if you sin, God is going to destroy you, he's going to punish you. This, unfortunately, is an idea that we got from different cultures and different religions, although it made its way into Judaism. Think about a mother or a father, a healthy mother and functional father, and I know that's not so common, but once in a while, you could find it. Okay. And your child misbehaves. Do you ever feel like if you're, in a, again, if you're a normal person and you're in a good place, right? You did your yoga, you did Pilates, you went to two therapists, you had your iced coffee, you ran for a few miles, you ate cucumbers, you did, you did wheatgrass juice, and now you're in a good space, right? And your child misbehaves. Do you like, I'm going to get you back. I'm going to take revenge from this four-year-old. Ooh, am I going to take revenge? Is that what drives you when you discipline your child? Vengeance. Or I'm going to show you who's boss in this house. You three-year-old boy chick. I'm going to show you who's the master of this house. You're going to learn. There's no such a thing. You love your child. If your child makes a mistake, you want to fix the mistake. You want to educate your child. Sometimes you want to discipline your child only because you want this child to be able to live a good life. Why would anybody think that God should be less than a normal, healthy father and mother? And whenever when we think about God in terms of he's going to get me, he's going to get back at me, he's going to show me who's boss, he's going to take revenge, the word punishment is a very dangerous word. Because the word punishment implies why would you punish anybody? Why would you punish somebody you love? You want to discipline, you want to help, you want to repair. I was not punishing my socks when I put it into the washing machine. Was I? Nor was I taking revenge from my socks. Nor was I showing my socks who's boss. I was doing one thing. I was trying to cleanse my socks and get rid of the smell and get rid of the dirt. The way I describe purgatory from a Kabbalistic and Hasidic point of view is Gehenna, hell is basically, here is what it is. It's cosmic therapy. It's cosmic therapy. You see the soul, the divine electricity that flows through your body is sacred. It's pristine. It's as pure and holy as it gets. But you know what happens in life sometimes? I don't know who I am. And I can tarnish. I can taint. I can impurify that sacredness, that purity, that divinity. Now, the person is unplugged. 
And the electricity wants to go back to the place of electricity. But there is toxicity. There is baggage. There are layers of cover-ups that don't allow the electricity to be in the natural place of where it is. Where is its natural place? The natural place of a soul is. It's a fragment of the divine. But it got toxic. Layers of dirt and filth may have gathered on it. Every time I lie, it's a stab in the chest of my soul. Every time I gossip or slander, my soul is hurt. It becomes infected. Every time I do something promiscuous or immoral, I hurt somebody, I insult somebody. If I don't fix it, if I don't repair it, there is a very deep blemish there. It doesn't only hurt the other person, it also hurts me. And sometimes I live a life in which I hurt myself very deeply. I made very bad mistakes that hurt me or hurt others. The soul doesn't forget. What does therapy look like? Anybody? Anybody goes to therapy? Okay, don't all raise your hands. What does the good therapist want to do? He wants to get out the infection. He wants to get those splinters out. Getting out a splinter hurts. You may have a psychoanalyst or a therapist or a good psychologist who's going to take you back to age four or age nine or age 16 or two years ago. And what's going to happen? If he's good or she's good, you may break down and weep uncontrollably. And the therapist will be very glad. Why? Because that is what allows you sometimes to spit out. Spit out the dysfunction. Spit out the trauma. Is therapy revenge? Is therapy because the therapist wants to take revenge, wants to punish you? It's sometimes the best thing for you. When we talk about afterlife, paradise, hell, all that, it's God doing therapy for the soul. Does therapy hurt? Whenever you get rid of dirt, it hurts. But it's not a pain that's coming from a bad place. It's the best pain in the world. It's getting out the trauma. It's getting out the splinter. It's getting out the toxicity. How many of us are comfortable sitting down with somebody and really laying everything bare, being naked and raw? You can't go back to your natural place if you're not naked, pristine, pure, and raw. But here's the deal. This is the world where transformation is possible every single moment. That's what we call tshuva. But in the afterlife, when the soul is unplugged, if that soul has trauma in it or toxicity in it, there's cosmic therapy that has to be done. The word for that in Judaism is called Gehenna. Or what some people like to call hell or purgatory. No, there's no divine barbecue where God is satayeing you like a hot dog. With lettuce and barbecue sauce and some french fries with a big lafa. And like, here's a good one. Here's a good one. I don't know if Dante's foreignness exists. When we speak about fire or snow, these are metaphoric concepts of various forms of therapy. That a soul needs in order to be clean. Here's an insight of the Baal Shem Tov. The holy Baal Shem Tov said the following. Ah, tune in. Psalm, Kael Nekamas Hashem is which psalm? Psalm, anybody knows Tehillim here? Kael Nekamas Hashem, Kael Nekamas Sophia. Anybody? Psalms 94. It's the song of Wednesday. You know the song of Wednesday? It starts like this. Not very romantic. El nekamois adenoi, el nekamois haifia. Translation. First, the, the translation in the books, which is not accurate, because no translations are accurate, you know that. So here's the inaccurate translation, then the accurate translation. Now you'll see why they do an inaccurate translation, because the accurate translation sounds weird. Here's the inaccurate translation. God is a God of revenge. The God of revenge has appeared. Okay? Now the accurate translation. Okay. Kale Nekomas Hashem. The God, known as Kale, is one of revenge. 
That's the God known as Yud Kei Vav Kei. The Kale, the God known as Kale of revenge has appeared. Where? What are you talking about? So King David says, God, by the way, you want to know God? Let me tell you. He is the God of revenge. This is why so many people have issues with God. <laughs> Imagine you're introducing yourself for the first time to a girl or a boy who you may, you want to date, maybe there'll be courtship and marriage, who knows. You remember your first date or second date, you introduce yourself, hi, my name is Steven, my name is Yankel, my name is George, my name is Yossel, my name is Moshe, my name is Chayim, whatever. Really, tell me about you. Huh. I am a man of revenge. <laughs> the man of revenge has appeared. Could you marry me? A lot of this in the Tanakh. What's going on? What's going on? So the told us Yaakov Yosef says, the great student of the Baal Shem Tev, Rabbi Yaakov Yosef of Pulna, I think in the portion of Boy, he says, let me tell you what I heard from my teacher, the Baal Shem Tev, the founder of the Hasidic movement. And this is what he said, open your hearts, you have to tune in a little bit. In Judaism, God has many, many names. You know, they say the Eskimos have like 70 names for snow. Because when you live in snow, you know the different names. I don't know if it's true. Well, Jews have endless names for God. Because when you're into something, you know every nuance. Right? How many names do you have for your kid? Right? Ziskite, Malach, Angel, Love, Terrorist, uh, uh, Migraine, Headache, uh, The Love of My Life, The Sweetest Thing That Ever Existed, The Most Greatest Challenge That Ever Existed. Etc. Jews have many names. For things you love, you have many names because you analyze it. So Jews have a lot of names for God, <laughs> very many. One of them is Kale. Kale is a name associated with love. Chesed Kale Kol Hayom. Another name is Yud Kei Vav Kei. Yud Hey and Vav and Hey, Havaya. That's the name of compassion. Then there's a name that identifies judgment. It's called Elohim. Elohim. King David is being repetitive. On three levels here. He says, Kael Nekama is Hashem. Kael, which was one name of God. Yeah. God is a, is a God of revenge God. The God of revenge has appeared. He should have said, the God of revenge has appeared. Or God is a God of revenge. He appeared. No. Kael Nekama is Hashem. The Lord is a God of revenge. The God of revenge has appeared. So the Baal Shem Tov says, how do you make sense of this verse? It says the names that are used for revenge are God's wrong names. The names should have been Elohim or other names that are associated with judgment, with vengeance. Not the names Kael and Yutke Vavke, which represent kindness and compassion. So he says that's what King David is teaching you. Kael Nekama is Hashem. You know which God takes revenge? Kael and Hashem, which are the two names of love and compassion. How are they associated with revenge? Revenge doesn't come from love and compassion. Revenge comes from the absence of love and compassion. Ah, that's why he says, Kael Nekama Sophia, the God of revenge has appeared. You know how God takes revenge? You know how he takes revenge? He appears. He appears. That's the revenge. What was the Baal Shem Tov teaching us here? He was teaching us something very profound. And that is this. I'm going to give a metaphor. Some of you will relate to it immediately. Some don't, won't. If you do, I empathize. If you don't, get out of the room. You're living with somebody. That person loves you like crazy. Love, Mamish is crazy about you. But you have so much trauma inside of you, you can't feel the love. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? Or you have trauma, or you suffer from a mental challenge, God forbid... It may be depression, borderline, similar stuff, bipolar. You cannot feel the love. You're always blaming them. Or you don't have mental illness, but you have trauma. You have so much trauma. You don't believe you're lovable. Is there anybody in this crowd who believes you are not lovable? So if somebody loves you, either they're sinister and they have an agenda, or they are mentally ill. If they love me, there's something very wrong with them. Now, very often people who suffer from this don't know this. 
I don't know that the reason I can't feel your love is because of my trauma. I think the reason I don't feel your love is because you're a bad person, because that's my trauma. My trauma eclipses its own toxicity by projecting back on you. You are the culprit. Do you understand what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen? If you don't understand, God bless you. If you do understand, take it to heart. Very often, I am loved, but I can't feel it because of my deep, deep toxic issues. And therefore, I see you as my enemy when really you are my greatest support, but I can't know it because I don't know how to look inside. It's too scary, so I go this way. And then one day, I may come to a place of sobriety or a place of clarity or a place of more health or a place of more oneness and suddenly I realize that the person I blamed for all of my challenges was the one who loved me most. What do you think I feel like on that day? There's a very deep shame. This is the metaphor. The metaphor that the told us Yaakov Yosef brings from the Baal Shem Tev, there was a man there was a man who betrayed the king and tried to kill the king because he thought the king was evil. And what did the king do? They told the king, execute him. The king said, no, bring him into the palace and give him everything and let him spend time with me. And that was the greatest punishment. What was the punishment? Suddenly he experienced the shame of seeing who he tried to murder. Says the Baal Shem Tev, God takes revenge. You know what God's revenge is? Haifia. He appears in your life. And when God appears in your life, that's God's revenge. It's a revenge that comes from Kael and Yutke Vavke, the names of love and compassion. Because what does the revenge look like? The revenge looks like, wow, that's embarrassing. I didn't know who you were. So let's make it very practical, okay? There's every person, every person sitting here, there's two people, there's not one person. There's two people. Who are the two people? There's who you are, who you are, but there's somebody else. Who's the somebody else? When God thought you up in his mind, what did he see? When God imagined you in his imagination, what did God see? There's who you are, and there's who you could be, who you're meant to be, who you were called on to be. When you create a company in your mind, you imagine something. When you create a marriage in your mind, you imagine something. When you build an infrastructure in your mind, you imagine what it looks like. When God conceived your soul in his mind, what was he thinking? What did he see in you? God saw something in you. That's who you could be. That is your ultimate potential. That is your ultimate calling. And then there is who you are. Who you are. How close do you think those two images are to each other? What would you say? <laughs> so, uh, uh, Henry Kissinger, the night before Richard Nixon resigns after Watergate. Richard Nixon is walking out of the White House at 2 in the morning. Henry Kissinger writes this. Nixon stops at the portrait of JFK who was killed 10 years earlier. Nixon and Kennedy didn't get along. They were rivals. Nixon speaks to dead, late President Kennedy in the portrait in the White House. And he says, President Kennedy, why do the American people love you? And why do they hate me? <laughs> Nixon was not very loved. Kennedy, ah, Camelot. Kennedys were untouchable. Why do they love you? And why do they hate me? Well, Kennedy didn't answer. He was in the portrait. <laughs> and Richard Nixon says, I'll tell you why. When they look at you, they see what they would like to be. <laughs> when they look at me, they see what they are. And that's very different. But one day, when I come, when I'm unplugged, I see everything clearly. And you know what happens? I see two videos playing. One video shows me what I was, what I looked like, what my mornings looked like, what my afternoons looked like, what my evenings looked like. The other video is also of me, but it's what I could look like. 
if I confront my fears, if I confront my traumas, if I confront my insecurities, if I confront my skeletons, if I confront my demons, if I believe that I am a channel of infinity in this world, if I see myself as a refrigerator channeling divine electricity and I don't try to be unplugged in the middle of this world. I see the second video. I see what God thought of me when he conceived my soul. What did God see in me? What did God see in you? What did God see in you? What was that product that God was creating? That's the second video. I see those two videos very clearly because I'm unplugged. For some people, watching those two videos is called paradise. But for other people... Watching those two videos is called hell. You know how God takes revenge? By appearing. By allowing you to see your truth. To see who you are. And you know why that's important? Because here, I can synthesize the two videos. How? Courage. Integrity authenticity and becoming the person I was meant to become. Reaching that soul that God imagined when he thought of me in his mind. So at last, at last, around the corner, this happened not far from here, baby camel turned to mommy camel and said, Mama, three questions. Not four, three. Yes, baby, what's the problem? Baby camel said, why do we have three ugly toes on each foot? Why were we cursed this way? Mama says, because we're camels. We're not lazy hippopotamuses who do nothing. We trek the deserts. We march thousands of miles. We need good sturdy feet. Mama, why these ugly eyelashes on our eyes? Huh? In the Sahara Desert, there are sandstorms. If we wouldn't have this protective gear, we would be blinded as we trek thousands of miles through the Sahara. Mommy, why these ugly humps? Why can't we just have flat, handsome, attractive backs? Huh. In the desert, there's no water. Do you know that camels are the only mammals who can go for weeks and months without water, without food? How? Because there's these grotesque humps that reserve all this fat and it gets dissolved. If we got no water, camels can go for weeks, for months, sometimes without water. Amazing. Mama, one more question. I got it. Three-toed ugly feet to march thousands of miles in the desert. Ugly eyelashes to protect us from the sandstorms as we go thousands of miles in the desert. Grotesque humps to contain all the fat as we travel thousands of miles in the deserts without food or drink. Mama, one last question. If so, what in the world are we doing in a cage in the Bronx Zoo? <laughs> That's the question everybody faces at what one point or another. What does it mean when the Talmud says, Some people have the afterlife here. It means that every morning when they wake up, they ask that question. What am I doing in a cage in the Bronx Zoo when I was called upon to be an ambassador of infinite love, light, and hope? Thank you. What did you think about this video? Comment below and click subscribe for more videos like this.